it figures that uh, it would take Payne Stewart to get me in a suit, but I never thought I would stoop to this. <laughs> Payne wasn't the most mechanically inclined person that I ever knew. Uh, I'll never forget the mistake he made when he told me the story of the time that he started his bass boat in his garage. <laughs> he sh Payne, uh, Payne showed me that bass boat. He was so proud of it. And, you know, it had the metal flakings on it and the beautiful brand new engine. And I knew he wasn't much of, much of a fisherman at the time. And I didn't know how often he would use this boat. And surely didn't know how little he knew about the boat. But uh, one day, he, I got to tell you, is he jumped in the boat. And uh, I guess feeling bad that he hadn't started the engine in a while, just, just put the key in the ignition and turned it over. Uh, he first took the time to squeeze the bulb, he knew that much, to prime the engine, and he turned the key over and the motor started and it was so loud and he said he was so happy that it kicked on, he was very surprised, but he kept revving in the engine, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, he just said he just, he said for five minutes the thing just ran like a champ and he just kept it going and, and uh, you know, a motor can't run, an outboard engine cannot run without water. And, it exploded. <laughs> Payne said he freaked out. Flames hit the ceiling and he described him fanning out of the ceiling like this. He, he leaped out of the boat and grabbed the hitch and ran out of the garage to keep the house from burning down. And then he made the mistake of telling me. <laughs> and I told everybody I knew about that. I, uh, I cut a, an, an ad out of a fishing magazine uh, for an outboard motor, and it was a big one-page ad, and I taped it to his locker at the next tournament, and I wrote a big note on top, just add water. <laughs> Once in a while, Payne Stewart got a few deals on his own. Uh, you remember the weed whacker, or the weed terminator? When I pulled into Payne's yard into, through his gate the other day, his, his yard was so beautifully manicured and the, the bushes were trimmed and the, the walk was edged and I was so thankful for the weed whacker. <laughs> Knowing full well Payne didn't know how to even start the weed whacker. To try to accept the magnitude of this tragedy <clears throat> is the most difficult thing that I've ever had to do. <sighs> the void and the sadness that we all feel is very real, but it is not without hope that we mourn. And we're not alone in our mourning, for the God of the universe joins us today in our sorrow. Verse 15 of the 116th Psalm says, His loved ones are very precious to him, and he does not let them die lightly. Snatched directly from the sky this past Monday, God called six of his loved ones home. Among them were three of my closest friends, Van Arden, Robert Fraley, and Payne Stewart. For me, the death of these three men will forever affect my life. For the next few minutes, I have the privilege of telling you why this is true. At the end of his life, the Apostle Paul looked back and said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. That's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Van Arden has finished the race, he has kept the faith, and the crown of righteousness is now his. Van Arden loved God. His faith in Jesus Christ guided him and sustained him. In the years I knew him, the evidence of his faith was unmistakable day after day. 
Van was a gentleman. I loved having him work for me. His words were always gracious. As an agent, his faithful, he was always faithful to those he served. As a negotiator, he was always prepared. As a competitor, he was relentless but fair. The tears of the clients and customers and competitors in this sanctuary today are proof of this faithfulness, diligence, and fairness. But more important to Van than his work was his family. Even in business settings, he often spoke of his love for Debbie and uh, their four children, Ashley, Ivan, Hanalee, and Danielle. He loved them dearly. This past weekend, Debbie told us that her husband had blessed her socks off. This is every man's dream. On the way to the airport this past Monday morning, Van called Debbie from his car, and the last words she heard him speak were, Debbie, I love you more than anything in the world. And this is every woman's dream. I love Van Arden. Robert Fraley has finished the race. He has kept the faith. And the crown of righteousness is now his. And although Robert and I had a professional relationship, he was first and foremost my friend, and he was like a father figure to me. In 1992, when I was diagnosed with cancer, in 1993, excuse me, Robert was the person I first called after I talked to my family. I knew that whatever I needed, Robert would be there. Robert wrote the press release to inform the world that I had cancer. Many, many times in that year, he and Dixie were there for me and proved their love to me and to my family. Robert loved God. He was obedient to him. It was his highest priority. He was a man of great wisdom. When I called Robert with a question or a problem, and I had many, and I called him often, I had absolute confidence that his counsel would be right. And over the years, I got in the habit of taking Robert's advice, and I'm very glad I did. Robert was a brilliant problem solver. He never fetched a situation that baffled him. He never panicked, even under great pressure. He was always in control, and he kept things in perspective. When I was doing chemotherapy in uh, 1994, a lot of people called me. And uh, I really uh, tried to be up and a source of hope and inspiration to anyone and everyone who called. And uh, I talked to Robert one day, and he, he said that I sounded down. And I told him that I was and that I felt bad about it because uh, I felt this burden to be a source of inspiration to all who called me to encourage them. And Robert, in his great wisdom, said to me, he says, you know, Paul, you don't have to be right. You don't have to be all right all the time. And he was right, and it lifted a great burden from my shoulders. And I thank him for that. Robert loved to laugh. I thought about it yesterday when we were uh, leaving their house from... Uh, from Robert and Dixie's house to the funeral procession and we were getting to go through the toll booths for free, <laughs> that Robert would have laughed and said, look what I did for you. I got you through those toll booths for nothing. <laughs> uh, those of us who knew him can still hear his laughter. And I'll always remember the smile on his face. I loved Robert Fraley. Van Arden and Robert Fraley were the best in their business. They had the incredible ability to be leaders, but they were also servants. And they were servants to the people that worked for them. They were their leaders and they were their servants, and that's a quality that uh, not many people have. Their professional direction for my life and career were almost flawless. And what they did for me and what they did for Payne Stewart was terrific. And they did a great deal for Payne. Robert and Payne were so close. Robert and Van and Payne, the three of them, were like one. 
but as, they, as good as uh, they were, the one thing that then Van Arden and Robert Fraley could not be for Payne Stewart, or could not do for Payne Stewart. They could not, they could give him advice, and they could find him the endorsements and negotiate his contracts, but they could not change Payne's heart. Only God had the power to change Payne Stewart's heart, and not long ago he did. He changed his heart. Payne Stewart has finished the race. He has kept the faith, and now the crown of righteousness is his. Payne Stewart loved life, and like Chuck said, he loved people. He was the life of every party. He loved to cook. He was comfortable around the grill. He was confident. You could tell he knew what he was doing. Robert Fraley was a clothes horse. But Payne Stewart was the fashion police. <laughs> How many times did Payne Stewart ask me if I got a free bowl of soup with that hat? <laughs> I always felt intimidated when I was going out with Payne because uh, I knew he was going to uh, assess what I was wearing. I felt pressure this morning, knowing he'd be watching. <laughs> Payne loved to fish, but sitting in a boat with Payne could be dangerous at times. I fished with him one time. Uh, I was still doing chemotherapy, and my head was bald as a cue ball, and I had on a hat. And we were in a small boat, and this fellow had taken us uh, to Lakeland. We met at a McDonald's in Lakeland, Florida, and uh, we went to one of the phosphate pits where they're catching fish, is like fishing in an aquarium almost. And uh, we were catching fish on a regular basis, and I was in the middle. It was a very small boat. The guy was running the trolling motor. I was in the middle. Payne was on the bow, and we're throwing these big lures. and, and uh, I kept telling Payne, you be careful now, don't you hook me. Oh, I'm not going to hook you, I'm not going to hook you. <laughs> we got to one point where we went, went through a canal and you could reach both banks. And I turned away for just one second. Because every time Payne cast, I watched. For two hours, I watched him. I ducked. And the one time I turned this way, I felt this whack upside my head. And I thought, oh, he hit me with a pole, you know. And I, I pulled my hat off and all nine hooks of this lure were buried in my hat. <laughs> when he realized I wasn't hurt, he laughed at me. It, it was a bruise on my head. It was a heavy lure. Well, Payne came over to fish with me again, and there, there was three of us, four of us total. And we had caught our bait and gotten to our spot. And, you know, when you shut down and you anchor up and you, you go, you know, into the com compartments and you put your wallet away in case you fall out, you don't want to get wet, you know, and you put stuff up. And, and we were doing that normal stuff and um, we had all pulled out helmets. <laughs> <laughs> and the four, and th three of us had on football helmets and Payne was, uh, wasn't looking and when he turned around, he, he almost, uh, <laughs> he wanted to leave. I had the privilege of playing golf with Payne at Disney this week. Uh, I hadn't played with him really since Fort Lauderdale. And uh, we played a practice round. We only played five holes. At Disney, you jump around in a cart. and We played our four or five holes together. And we talked about the Ryder Cup and what it was like. You know, he shared stories about what it was like and how he was going to do the team. And he, he said one thing that he was going to do in the four years from now. He already knew when he was going to be picked. I don't know if he had uh, already written Jim Autry and told him when to pick him or what, but it was, it was a fact that Payne Stewart was going to be a Ryder Cup captain. Payne said to me, he says, one thing I'm going to do when I'm Ryder Cup captain, he says, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name you and Hal Sutton my co-captains. It's the first thing I'm going to do. And uh, I'm so thankful for those words. It meant so much to me. At the time, I just... 
thanked him for that, you know, but certainly didn't know the magnitude of what that would mean to me. Uh, and then we played together and had a great time uh, for two days. And, uh, you know, I wasn't really much help to my amateur, and Payne patted me on the back and said, don't worry, Paul, I'll take care of your amateur the next two days. And he did. He took care of him. For many years, it seemed like Payne Stewart was first in Payne Stewart's life, but not long ago, this began to change. We all saw his pride and his occasional cynicism and sarcasm begin to soften. I believe the death of Payne's father started this process, however gradual. Payne and I were having dinner a few years after he had said goodbye to his dad. And it, was a, it was a deep conversation we'd gotten into, and I made a comment to him that I had heard from Larry Moody, who leads our Bible studies on the tour. I told Payne that we're not in the land of the living, going to the land of the dying but that we are in the land of the dying going to the land of the living. And I knew these words found a mark in Payne's heart. But only God could do that because only God can change hearts. After he won Pebble Beach in February, the world saw his tears and heard him talk about his love for Tracy, his wife, and Aaron and Chelsea's precious children. He loved them so much. And B, you know how much Payne loved you. He talked about you so much. This past summer, after his victory in the U.S. Open, he embraced his friend Phil Mickelson. And he said to Phil, this may not be exactly what Payne said, but he said, you'll win this someday, but right now you've got more important things to do. Go home and enjoy the birth of your baby girl. They knew they were having a girl. He told, he told Phil, you'll be a great daddy. You'll be a great daddy. Payne Stewart, the family man. Only God could do that because only God can change hearts. I first met Payne in 1982 on the putting green in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. It was before he donned his trademark knickers and Tam O'Shannon hat, yet he still stood out. What I had mistaken for earrings was actually acupuncture needles. They were in there to help improve his concentration. It must have worked because he won the event. In the post-victory interview, he announced to the, to the world that the tour needed more blonde-haired, blue-eyed guys. And I remember thinking, who in the heck is this guy? <laughs> the brash comment wasn't enough for Payne, though. The outfits guaranteed that he'd stand out. He wanted to be a star, and he believed that he had the talent to do it. And he didn't mind the attention. Payne got a lot of verbal abuse from everyone, including me, but was thick-skinned and he could take it, and he was very good at dishing it out. Payne was a vicious competitor. He only played to win. This was all he ever knew. But not long ago, we started to see something new, something totally different. We saw a man who was interested in people. He was as interested in people as he was in golf. A man who played to win, but truly loved others at the same time. Payne became gracious in victory and gracious in defeat. And only God could do that because only God can change hearts. During the past year, everyone who knew Payne Stewart saw this dramatic change in his life. They saw in Payne what the Bible calls a peace that passes all understanding. Only God could do that because only God can change hearts. It's an honor to stand before you as Payne Stewart, Robert Fraley, and Van Arden's friend. And because I knew them so well, I know what they would have wanted me to say in my closing remarks. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you have done, if you feel the tug of God's Spirit on your heart, do not turn away. If like Payne, Robert, and Van, you want to know the happiness and peace that only Jesus Christ can bring. I invite you to confess your sin and receive him as your Savior. Regardless of what your life has brought you, his love is enough and his peace is for real. Because I knew these men, I will never be the same. I'm so thankful for their friendship and their character and their faith.
Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye, Robert. Goodbye, Pam. And we loved you, and we will miss you, but we know we will see you again. <laughs>